Call to order the City Council work session for the City of East Grand Forks for Tuesday, April 11th. It is now 5 o'clock. The City Clerk, please call roll. Here. Council President Mark Huston. Here. Council Vice President Jim Rinko. Here. Council Members Clarence Vetter. Here. Ben Huck Here. Dale Helms. Here. Brian Larson. Here. Karen Peterson. Does term quorum number one, discussion on proposed police recruit position. Chief Fedlin, and he's on Zoom, so. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, We've discussed this topic a couple times before and, and we've gotten a variety of input from members uh, since our since we last discussed this, this March. I've been working with Terry Kitson and Mr. Halstead. Uh, I've got a variety of suggestions from them and I'm uh, hopefully we've got this now referring to a point where council will be uh, pleased to move forward with this. That's, I guess that's my hope. Uh, I'll just give a quick rundown. Two different formats that students could be in to be eligible to be in this program. One, they would be in a current two-year law enforcement program that includes their skills program, skills testing, schooling. Thief River Falls Northland Community College is, is one of the schools in the area that has that. Alexandria Technical College is another. Moorhead Tech, on the other hand, though, just does the schooling, and they still those students still have to attend the skills program in the summer, as with any four-year criminal justice students. Um, so there'd be two different ways we would be potentially approaching this. Number one, if they're in one of those two programs where their skills was included, we would potentially take them on as a police recruit during that final semester. In all reality, this for anybody that's uh, in that stage in their, in their training and education, that wouldn't be anybody we'd be looking at until probably second semester next year. The other option would be those students that either are finishing up a two-year law enforcement program and have to go to skills this summer or a four-year criminal justice program where they would have to go to skills. Those people we could still target for potential bringing into this program this spring and early summer. The skills program in Alexandria, for example, starts in late May. Um, by the way we have this presented at the present time, uh, any interested applicants would submit their applications for this position to the city of East Grand Forks HR. Terry would then review them to make sure that they met one of those listed objectives in, in one and two, uh, one of those re requirements. And if they did, those eligible people would be then moved on to the Civil Service Commission and used by that commission. Uh, they would then move forward to the police department, any people that they felt uh, met the requirements and that they, they approved to move on into the process. At that point in time, the police department would interview those subjects just like we would for a regular police officer position. And uh, one or more, depending on uh, what the situation was and, and our eligible uh, openings at that point in time could be selected to move into the police recruit position. And for that, they would have seven conditions. They would receive a conditional job offer as a police officer, and they would have seven conditions. First, they would have to complete their educational program that they were in right then, whether that's the second semester, excuse me, the final semester of a two-year program or the skills program uh, for the students that would be eligible to go to skills. And they would have to, upon completing that program, they would have to pass the post license test and at that point in time, they would be eligible to be hired as a police officer in state minister. And then they would also have to do all of the things that are normal police officer applicants. That's the background check. They would have to pass a pre-employment medical exam. They would have to pass a pre-employment psychological exam. They would have to pass a pre-employment physical agility test. We use a program called Work Steps, which is a physical agility testing program that the League of Minnesota Cities developed. Um, there's a, it was formerly offered in Fargo. It's, it's now Riverview in Crookston is actually in the process of adopting that program. We'll have it up and running in the near future. And then finally, of course, City Council would have to approve the primary. So, uh, my, my proposal would be for these subjects, once they began this final stage of their program, after they've been selected as a police recruit, they would receive a $400 weekly forgivable loan. And so each they were in that program, the, typically maybe to eight weeks. Uh, they would get that $400 forgivable loan. Belstead and I have, have, have talked a little bit about this, but he would be having to write up whatever we would need to have for a loan document for these subjects. And if they did not uh, complete whatever uh, employment requirement with the city of East Grand Forks, uh, for example, if they left employment, I, I had suggested two years, if they left employment for two years, they would have to pay back that forgivable loan. So I'll just leave it at that right now. Um, oh, one other comment, or one other thing I, I guess I want to point out. If we if make sure we don't have somebody that we're sitting waiting for the program, and then we have somebody else come along and apply that's already ready to go, um, we would never have more than 
one less person than we have open hands. So if we only had one open hand, we wouldn't bring anybody on as a police recruit. We, to, we could bring up to one person on as a police recruit. So it's always at least one open hand get hired. Any questions? Let me have a question. Mr. Helms. Yeah, uh, Chief. Uh I think he might be muted. I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, thanks. Since we had uh, been talking about this, have you had any interest in anybody contacting you about this program? I'm just curious. We, we haven't publicized this program other than what's been in the media from just based on the council meetings. We have not advertised it as we've done our recruiting visits. That would be something that if council were to move this onto the agenda next week and be approved next week, we would immediately start uh, advertising this very heavily into the students that would potentially be going to schools. Yeah, I knew we hadn't advertised. I was just curious if anybody, if you'd heard word of mouth or anything from anybody that might be interested or anything, if it's, if this is the type of program that we need to make, to put this to work. I guess that's what I was kind of getting at, so. Yeah, I've not heard of anybody. Um, just so council's aware, we do have one uh, applicant in the mix. We are, are in the process of scheduling him for his uh, psychological and medical exams, and those will be taking place in about two weeks. Okay, thank you. Mayor Gander. Just uh, first of all, double checking to make sure HR is fully on board with this and also um, legal is fully on board. Terry told me she was satisfied with it is, as it is. Uh, she did forward it to the Civil Service Commission. They requested I make a couple minor modifications, which I have done. I really appreciate you know the the detail that you've put to this thing and the steps that are involved in the, the whole sequence it went from a concept to a, a pretty pretty good package in a short time chief and I want to thank you for bringing this I think it'll be one more step to um, making sure that we have a, a good good patrol good group of officers good group of staff so thanks for the work that you've put into this thank you mr. president and just to answer uh, mr. or chief Hedlund's questions I did meet with Chief. I met with uh, uh, Ms. Knudsen. We discussed this. It went through a number of different modifications. Um, and I believe if it's passed or agreed upon by the council, we can uh, provide the uh, necessary documentation and uh, that's that would be required for uh, uh, a forgivable loan, if that's the case. And then uh, any type of a waiver, if there's going to be and, and the police already have a waiver if there's going to ultimately be some ride-alongs or anything like that. So we should be okay with all of those situations as long as uh, Terry and the civil service have all the information that they need to be able to make a, uh, a, a decision regarding the uh, applicant's qualifications. So with that, and it looks like they did, we had had that conversation. Uh, everything should be in place. Chief, also thank you for uh, working on this. Also thank you to Terry and Ron for working on this. Really appreciate it. One question I do have, um, and it's minuscule, is with this forgettable loan, will they get a 1099 then? We just want to make sure that's going to be laid out in whatever documents we have. Attention, uh, uh, upon forgiveness, it would be 1099. Okay. So I just want to make sure. And I, I would assume that would be in the documents that they've signed that notifications. So, anybody else have any questions at this time? Ben. Thank you, Mr. President. Chief, um, I didn't see it called out here. Um, maybe I missed it. How many weeks would they receive the forgivable loan? It would depend on whether they were in the final semester, which uh, is going to be very from program to program, but I think it would be typically 16 to 18 weeks. And the schools program, I believe, is 10 weeks long at Alexandria. That would be the most likely school that we would actually be from because we are going to be pretty people with it. Okay, so like $4,000 then? Roughly. Okay. Um, and then I see the repayment stipulation. Are we going to prorate that? Say they work for the city for a year. Would we only require them to pay half of that back? Or, you know, if I go one year and... 11 months, am I going to have to pay back the full 4000 or am I only going to be on the hook for $200? I guess I hadn't thought about that. I know for the the home incentive forgivable loans, if uh, that's a 10-year period, if you leave after nine years, six months, you still pay the entire 5000 back. Okay. Uh, I, if you're going to follow, follow that, it would be the entire amount. 
I'm, I'm not sure where everybody else stands, but I feel like we pro prorate it. Yeah, most health, most healthcare yeah. facilities prorate it. So I'm fine either way. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else have anything? I see nothing else, Chief. Unless you thank have. You. So, thanks. I'll move on to number two, uh, Police Department Climate Assessment Summary. Um, before we hand it off to uh, Mr. Murphy, I'm, I'm going to make some comments here, and I'm going to hand it off to the mayor, then we'll move on to Mr. Murphy. Um, I, I, I want to thank all the officers and staff that uh, went through this uh, assessment process with Ms. Hastings. Um, it was a uh, process that I'm sure um, that they went in and wanted to make sure that they were upfront and wanted to make sure that this was a successful um, process. I want to make sure that the chief knows that I am 100% behind him. I want the chief to know that whatever we do going forward, processes, changes, whatever we have to do, um, and I think I want him to know that he can rely on me and I will stand behind him and do what it takes. So again, I want to thank everybody who took um, time to do this. Um, again, if you're part, part of this process and you still want to reach out and discuss anything with myself or the mayor or any other council members, please do so. Um, you can reach us by email or our cell numbers are on the website also, but uh, if you do want to do that, I would encourage it. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the feedback that we received so far um, and um, hopefully um, we are on board to move forward and to make this a successful department, a department that <coughs> attracts staff, police officers, and that we can get the full staff and then keep moving from there. So it's a statement I wanted to make um, and I'll hand it off to Mr. Gander. Thanks, Mr. President. And once again, I'll just open up by saying once again, I, um, I want to restate my full support for Chief Hedlund and the position that he's, ha that he's in and, uh, and the work that he does. And uh, just the, the, again, the quality of leadership that he's shown to our police force. I also have a deep respect and appreciation for every single one of our police officers. As we sat here gathered the other night to a person, every single one, deepest respect. And I'm not ashamed to say, again, respect, um, admiration, you pick a word, that's, the, that's what they deserve, every single one of them. Um, it, it's painful to think that there's some sort of a divide that's taken place, and yet I know each one of these folks and I know that we can pull it back together. You know, in the military they talk about readiness. They think about readiness of the, of the troops to go into battle or whatever it is that they have to do. And readiness is a product of training. It's a product of rest and recuperation, maybe a little bit of uh, time on shore if you're a, a sailor and you've got to recharge and get ready to go again. Um, it's a product of having the right equipment. But it's also a product of operating inside of a chain of command. And um, that chain of command is, is there for your protection and it's there for your effectiveness and it's essential to the readiness of any group, and that includes our police force. And when we think of that chain of command, you also have to have the backing of anyone at the top of that chain of command operating inside of that. That one needs to know that if they observe something in the chain of command that isn't quite right, and they want to remedy that, that they have the full support of whoever it is above them in the chain of command to, to put that in place. And I want our chief to know that he has our backing completely um, as we go forward um, within that chain of command and anything else that we need to do to help bring our group together and, and again, maximize their effectiveness and their enjoyment. Again, part of readiness will be um, enjoyment of coming to work, right? If, if you're coming to work and having a thought of, you know, uh, gee whiz, I can't wait for the shift to end, you know, that's not ready. Readiness is being alert, being energetic, really enthusiastic about what you're doing. That's where we're headed. That's where we're headed as a, as a police force. And, and we have some ideas. Um, by the way, to any other officers who want to meet, any one of the officers, it's really, I think, a good way to meet is to send an email to President Olstead and me together. 
Um, it's kind of a nice way for us to meet this way if he has an idea or if I have an idea. We both see things a little bit differently um, as to how things are and you know how we can just have a nice visit with anybody, any member of the staff, anyone who wants to visit, we're available to do that. And, um, and we'll just compile everything and, and it'll be essential. You know, just like we've always said, if you're gonna make a decision, you don't just want the good news and the happy news, you want all the news, you want all the information, you need all of it to make a full and balanced decision and, and a strategy going forward. And that's what we're gonna need then is the insight Anyone willing to talk, we're willing to talk. We'll set aside the time necessary to get this right. We're gonna, again, bring it out, work through it, and do whatever we have to do to, to make sure we're all pulled together having fun. And, and Mr. Olstead likes to quote me back and say, and at the end of the shift, you all should have something left in your tank for your family, right? That's part of the objective here. Home, healthy, and, and in, a, in a proper mindset to go home and maybe get some rest and, and be a good dad, husband, wife, mom, whatever that might look like. So again, I'm very thankful to be where we are. Um, parts of this process are, are not that enjoyable. I'll just be very honest about it. Anytime that you're going in, um, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's a weird analogy, but let, let's say you're gonna do surgery on anything. Initially, it looks worse before it looks better. <laughs> And that's the way when you're, doing, when you're doing surgery to make anything better, the first step is to make it look a lot worse. And then out of the back end of that, it looks a lot better. And that's really, I think, the process that we're going into um, to bring full healing and restoration and, and to make this police force a magnet for the people who are in it and the ones that are not in it who might consider, hmm, where should I go as, a, as I finish my education or five years into my career. We love those five-year officers coming in. They were all well-trained and everything. So uh, we're gonna make this police force into that kind of a magnet for, for all of our staff. And, um, and again, clean up some things and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that we'll get that done. Thanks. Before you, we hand it off to Mr. Murphy, I just want to make sure that everybody <coughs> knows that I'm sure there are a um, bunch of them are watching. Uh, let you know that we're, we are not done. We are not complete with what we were intending to do. We're gonna keep moving forward and we're gonna do what we need to do to make sure that uh, we take care of what's going on. So I, I want them to know that we're committed and I want them to, again, if you wanna to talk to us, please reach out. Mr. Murphy. All right. uh, thank you, Council President, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so what I'll do just very briefly and very, rather quickly here, I'll go through a little bit of the background. Um, what the takeaways were from the uh, assessment summary, and then what our options are for our next steps. Um, so uh, I think as everybody's quite aware, um, there were some indications of some potential dissatisfaction uh, that were brought forward um, uh, to this, both to myself and to the city council. Uh, the council did meet then to review that situation, um, and out of that it was recommended that uh, we do an assessment of the department. Uh, Pemberton Law was hired to conduct a climate assessment um, of the working conditions and um, um, climate of the PD. Uh, Christy Hastings of Pemberton Law conducted the assessment. Uh, she interviewed 19 individuals over three days and she did prepare a comprehensive report. That report then was subsequently summarized into the document that was be that's before you tonight. Um, this document was also presented to the police department as a whole, as I believe Mr. Um, Gander and Mr. Olstead have alluded to uh, earlier. Um, and of that, there was uh, the in, there was two members of the department that were not a, in in attendance either in person or via Zoom, and both of those had um, um, outstanding commitments that they could not break. Uh, so I think that's a very good indication of the desire of the department to move forward and to. Um, um, you know, make this place better, um, a better place to work. So the four takeaways uh, from that report in the summary, number one, uh, say so we're generally on the right path, uh, but we do need to reunite uh, the PD. There are some fractions uh, within there. Uh, number two, uh, to help get to where we need to be, we'll need to implement um, some respectful workplace training and define the rules and expectations of how we talk to each other, how we talk about each other, and how we interact with each other. Uh, number three, determine how to best uh, rotate or utilize the drug task force represent, re representative and the investigator position. 
uh, and finally to uh, determine the appropriate amount of time uh, spent um, in dispatch um, in the duty areas and, and talking amongst themselves. So this assessment was done because we needed an unbiased assessment of the department so that we could determine what appropriate actions might uh, be taken. So are the potential next steps that um, the options that are available to the city uh, is number one, um, to identify an individual or company that fits our circumstances and specific needs to develop, implement, and monitor respectful workplace training and follow-up. Uh, number two, implement uh, the resulting rules and expectations about how we communicate with, with each other and have appropriate follow-up with that as well. And three, uh, begin the process to determine the best course of action and process to rotate the drug task force position and the investigator positions. So that is uh, a little bit of the history, um, the kind of a summary of the report and what our potential next steps are. So we'll take any questions that uh, you may have. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy at this time? Chief, did you want to add anything? I want to make sure I call on you, just to make sure. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone within the police department that did take part in the consultant interviews, and I appreciate the support from Council and Mayor and Mr. Murphy. So I think we'll everybody's going to be working together to move forward in the best possible manner and I, I want to thank the members of our department of course because they have a ton of very talented people that are very dedicated to the city of East Kirk Fox. So, and obviously this job would be possible without the work they do thank you chief thank you sir anybody else have any questions mr larson thank you mr president um yeah i'd just like to extend my thanks for everyone involved in putting this um document together and um I, I really appreciate the, how the takeaways were broken out into four kind of distinct areas where there's potential for, for improvement. I think that that's going to really help us to focus on um, some of the action items that are coming out of this report. I would encourage us to pre-schedule a follow-up interview in process like we've done here today as a way of measuring improvement against these four items down the road. I don't know if it's a year or six months, uh, people can discuss that, but it's important that we're, we're measuring improvement against these items. What gets measured matters, I think everyone understands that, and that'll show our commitment to you know real change. This is definitely not lip service, but if we've got a fully thought out plan that, that's going to report back improvement in these four items, I, I really think that'll help the entire process. So Thanks, that's sir. my thoughts. Thank you. Anybody else have anything this if time? I, if I could toward that, I'd say three to six months would be plenty soon, I mean, and, and long enough. We should see some progress, and it would create a little more urgency in the, in the shorter time frame. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Not, thank you, Chief, for being on. Enjoy your conference. Uh, move on to number three, update on the Faith Park project, Mr. Emery.
street, you kind of see where we're proposing to install a picnic shelter in that area. Um, you can also see on both ball fields there, kind of on the north and south side, we're going to be constructing some sidewalk from the street up to the seating area to make those areas ADA accessible. Um, and then like on sheet C4.3, uh, that first avenue northeast again, it's abandoned. We're going to be basically removing all of that old pavement and putting the curb and gutter essentially straight through um, you know, the old street there, just kind of close that off. The street will be removed, filled in, and, and basically seated. So then you get to Lake Sheet C4.4. Um, again, showing there basically construction of a new boat ramp. Uh, one thing we're looking at doing is having uh, a larger ramp with a dock essentially down the middle of the ramp so that you'd be able to launch your boat from each side. Um, and again, trying to kind of recess it back into the bank there so as you launch your boat, you're not, you know, right out into the, the current of the river there. So again, right now we're proposing about 28 uh, stalls for boat truck parking. And then just kind of on the south side, we got about 12 stalls there for just regular vehicle parking, you know, whether they're using the, uh, you know, the kayak launch that's going to get relocated down to this area, um, you know, there for a picnic, whatever, you know, they may be, we'll have some just general vehicle parking areas. Again, this parking lot area is going to be all gravel, but we are going to, to kind of delineate it, help with the uh, runoff. We are going to put in some curb islands, uh, curb and gutter, kind of around the perimeter of it. And what we're looking at is kind of on, <clears throat> I call it the north side of the parking lot. Um, we're going to utilize basically a kind of a drive over curb there so that people are able to access that area just to the north of kind of the parking lot, which is going to kind of be utilized as overflow parking, um, you know, in larger events such as catfish days, uh, catfish can eat, that type of stuff. So. So again, that area, not a whole lot would be done with it, probably stay similar to what it is now. We would <clears throat> probably help delineate that area. We're looking at putting in just some wood posts along there, again, just to try to keep people maintained to that area, especially vehicle traffic. Um, and, and again, just kind of delineate that area better. And then you can kind of see too with all of this, um, you know, we're gonna put in kind of a concrete seating area looking at potentially up in that same area, putting in a solar light, just so that there's some light there um, towards evening. And then there'll be a sidewalk that we're gonna install kind of from that concrete seating area down to the relocated uh, boat dock. So again, I think a lot of nice different things going on in that area, so. Then you get to sheet C 5.4 and 5.5. Um, there, what we're just showing is different areas that we're looking at um, seating. You know, some of it probably more of a you know, residential type of grass where you gotta mow it, maintain it. And then we were kind of throwing out the idea, um, you know, kind of south of the proposed uh, parking lot area and kind of heading south, you know, down to where the Red Lake, Red River kind of meet. Um, you know, that area where we're kind of talking about maybe that would be more of a, a native seed mixture. Um, and I did get just this morning, or this afternoon I should say, from our landscape architect, just a couple ideas of just, you know, what that would maybe look like. Again, those native seed mixtures, you know, there is some maintenance involved with them in those first year or two, but after that, you know, it is fairly maintenance free. Um, you know, but again, you know, do we, if we go that direction, do we want kind of a native seed mixture that's got some flowers and such in it, you know, similar to that top photo, or, you know, you can just do, you know, some type of seed mixture, which looks, you know, but to me, just an overgrown field, that bottom, that bottom photo there. So again, I thought, I think Reed and I were just looking for, you know, maybe some feedback, um, you know, what, if you guys have any 
suggestions, input for what we would want to see in that area. Um, we're also going to be constructing, which kind of shows up on sheet C5.5, they're just a, kind of a gravel trail um, down to, again, where the Red Lake and the Red River kind of meet there, and then kind of having a gravel parking area there. Um, you know, I think our goal is, is really to get this area adjacent to the river, kind of get a reshaped, re-landscaped, um, and then hopefully, you know, even by seeding it, I would think with a native seed mixture, would kind of, I would hope, would detour to people from wanting to, you know, to continue to drive through that area, tear it up, so. So I guess with that, I don't know, if anyone have any thoughts on what you'd like to see there? Hey, Reed, if you only have anything to offer, please, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks, Steve, and everybody at Widseth, along with Steve, has worked really hard on putting these plans together so far, so it's really coming together nicely. I think I, I would try to direct um, or be interested in, in thought process from all of you on maybe three different questions to look at as you look through this. Um, as Steve detailed everything, when you look at the parking lot area where the boat ramp will be, that 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 overflow lot that he referenced just to the north of the parking lot area, the way that we're planning that right now, proposing is essentially leaving this, the soils as is. It's kind of the current gravel parking space that where the, the boat trailers park today. Um, we, we wouldn't take that all out and top seal and to, top soil and seed with grass. It would basically just stay as is gravel. Um, that's an easy change if we think that we'd rather see it be seeded with grass and have it be a grass overflow parking space. Um, that's a relatively easy change for us to make if there's interest in that. I think the benefits of it is that could the grass would look nicer if it's clean and dry and not rutted up, but then we run the risk of if it needs to be used for overflow parking and it's wet, we could have a mess on our hands. So that's question one. Um, the second question in my mind is uh, in the uh, native grass area is just again to Steve's point is do we want to have that be a mowed grass or a native grass that would not would be unmowed for the large part of the, the years um, and tied into that question is this gravel access road that leads down to that kind of shore fishing site on the fork of the river. Um, the initial concepts we put together for this project showed that area having more of those treated posts every six feet lining that gravel road with the goal that we would create um, create designated this is where you can drive this is where we don't want you to drive and the point being there is that we all know what it looks like now just a rutted up mud mess everywhere um, there is if we continue to go that route, which I would say that's the route I'm in favor of from a just general use standpoint, it'll give everybody that track. This is where we want you to drive. You, know, you can't drive outside the wooden post designated road. Um, there will be a, potentially be some pushback to that locally just because people like the way it is now, the people that use it properly like to be able to drive their pickup to wherever they want to park and fish that day. And something like this would create, you have to drive in on this road, park in the designated parking area and walk to your shore fishing site. Um, so I think that's a good one for discussion, for feedback from all of you, if there's a pr preference one way or another as we look at finishing the design. Do anybody have any questions or Mr. Larson? Sure. Yeah, I've got a few comments. Uh, I guess I can give you some feedback on on your three items as well, Reed. I think for the uh, first area next to the parking lot, um, kind of see both sides there. Might be in our best interest to leave that as gravel for for now, and and see how that looks with the rest of the project developed. I'd, I'd hate to put a lot of money into good black dirt and topsoil and then have a muddy mess if we have a wet catfish days. Uh, so I think I, that might be more prudent and could save a little bit on the cost. Uh, for the seeding mix, I, I really do like the uh, native seeding mix. I can tell you from my own experience uh, working on the UND campus, it can be very difficult to get it to take. Uh, there's a lot of thistle and of course weeds come up first. But once that native seed does take, the, the root structure is so much deeper than turf grass, it's going to help to hold that bank in place. 
And then I, I like the uh, native prairie look or the, un, you know, un, unkept field, I guess. We have some areas along the greenway where we have the taller grass. And I, I really like that look. It's, you know, it's how it used to look before we all got here. So I think that that's nice. And then yes to the wooden posts to uh, keeping the cars uh, where they need to be. I just had a few other questions, sorry to like bombard you with all this. Um, when this is a nicer street and um, it's more attractive and maybe it's it's more visual, uh, you know, people take it now. Myself, I use it to, to get around trains. I think we all do. Uh, and there's there's been some speed bumps down there to kind of slow down uh, speeds in that area. Should we be considering speed bumps in that area to maybe discourage um, day by day travel down in, in this area? It's just a topic. I, I don't love speed bumps more than anybody else does, but I don't want a kid with a fishing pole to get hit by a car either. So something to think about. Um, I talked about the seed mix. Uh, and then the uh, boat launch area, Steve, some of the feedback that I've gotten from anglers is um, it's tough to launch a boat or to get your boat back on the trailer in the current of the river. And um, whatever we could do with this design to give us a little bit of space of some calm waters. I don't know if we have to build a little bit of a jetty structure out with some riprap. That, that sounds very expensive. Or bring that, I, I see that you've brought the um, entrance to that concrete ramp back a little bit. But I think just a little bit of space in there for calm waters for someone like myself who's pretty clumsy with a boat. Uh, it's it's pretty tough working in the river, so. And that's, that's kind of what we're trying to achieve there. We have, you know, basically cut that boat back yeah. so that the dock system and such will be, you know, in set, basically won't be out in that main river channel, so mm -hmm. that's something we have tried to achieve here. That's great. I think that is important. That's all I had. I, I'll okay. shut off the mic. Go ahead, see if anyone's there. Okay. One other thing I want to cover. Maybe Andrew. Yeah. Um, I, I also like the idea of leaving it gravel to the north. I think there will come a time when we will expand the parking. I think that the use of this is just going to grow over time. And I think we would regret if we had those few spots. It would almost be like, wow, didn't you know catfish days were going to be this big of a deal and uh, that we'd need all this parking. So I think if we do maybe, like you say, create a, a boundary there, leave it as it is in gravel, I think, and eventually, it's, I think we're going to want to mirror that parking over to there. Um, so that we have enough parking for double that many boats and trailers eventually. Um, as far as the grass, whichever we choose, if you all like the flowers or not flowers, um, I'm sure you guys have planned that we're going to have to mow it at some interval. Or willows come in and then you lose your, your sight lines and visibility. Kind of like what's happened along River Road. You know, eventually the, the, the trees come in and it turns into a softwood forest and the hardwood forest, you know, the transition that it goes through. So whatever we do in here for grasses or flowers or some combination, you'll definitely want to plan to, to knock it down at least once a year to stop the tree growth from coming in. And uh, finally, I do like the idea of the gravel road wrapping around, even if it does limit the options just a little bit. Um, it will keep people from traveling across there um, into what we've planted. Um, it will let us create a nice firm road, in, even to their benefit. When they go cross country through there, it ends up such a rutted mess. I'm surprised they're not stuck in there half the time trying to get to their favorite spot. Whereas if we designate a little bit of a gravel road, we can compact some material in there, actually give them a better way in and out of there to go fishing along the river bank. Um, and then I think the other thing we want to keep in mind, whatever we do in there, keep in mind the footprint of our master plan because some of this is just open space that eventually will have some more features built into it, whether it's five years, 10 years, 15 years from now. Um, some of these are just placeholders against our master plan that eventually will have, I think, more features built into it. Thanks. Mr. Riopil. Yeah, I like the gravel overflow lot, maintenance free pretty much. You just might have to drag it once in a while. And I think we could use the baseball field drag just to go over it to smooth it out a little bit at times because there will be some ruts. Sounds like a part-time job for you. <laughs> I got time. I'll go do it down here. <laughs> Mr. Emery. Um, so great feedback. I think we, you know, we got the feedback we want from the council. Um, so just kind of, you know, looking at 
schedule too. Um, I think our, our goal is to still um, try to get this wrapped up for the next couple weeks. Um, you know, get this out for, for bids. You know, we know it is getting a little bit later in the, the bidding season. So what we're thinking at doing there too is we're going to have to be very flexible too with our construction schedule to try to work around you know a lot of these events and summer activities with the ball fields and such. So. So Reed and I are going to kind of discuss that more, but our thought is to get a bid, you know, see what we get for pricing, but I think be flexible with our with our schedule. Um, you know, if we get a contractor that is getting full already this year, we're going to look at, you know, having a completion date of next year for, you know, a lot of this work. Um, Reed said that, uh, you know, the grant dollars are available or need to be used up by 2025. So, you know, we would try to be done with construction sometime in, summer fall of 2024 would be our goal so that's kind of where we're at with things right now okay. anybody else have anything from ben thank you uh just a question on where the three roads meet uh, right under the bridge um is there any plan on doing anything traffic wise even a stop sign there because there's when people are driving under to get around the train they drive like maniacs down there and it's a it's three roads coming together um that don't have any sort of regulation at all i think there's a yield isn't there is one way there's a yield yeah. i've never seen it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you say you're driving too fast that's why um and then i don't think there's anything there once was I just I know. Where was that snow blowing If I had a guess, I would think it's the yield came from the road to the south, and that the, the one running under and then east had the right of way. And then second comment, I don't know if we can move the project out this far, but the, the road going right underneath the train bridge is like a car and a half wide. Um, so I don't know if we can widen that out whether through this project or something else. So that's my only comments. I did mention that to Jason, that that at, I asked Jason if that's something he has looked at for street maintenance. It wouldn't be, uh, the funds for the grant wouldn't be eligible to extend beyond that um, because they have to use specifically what we said we were gonna use them for. Uh, but that's on Jason and Steve's radar to look at some street maintenance there too. And we will be looking at that. As far as uh, what we talked about mainly was some of the potholes, repairing some of the potholes along there. But we could also see if we could widen it a little bit down there as well. Great, thanks. And we'll discuss too bad kind of some yield sign stops. Like something to do to control traffic a little bit there, better there because it is a speed zone. So. Yep. All right, anybody else have anything? Appreciate it. Thanks, both of you. <clears throat> Number four, discussion on the outdoor rink project. Read. All right. Thank you again, Mr. President. Um, some members from the Blue Line Club are here, Judd Staus, Mike Colstow, and Nicole Pape. So they'll certainly be welcome to speak on this too. Um, thanks to Steve again at Widseth. Steve has uh, volunteered a lot of Widseth's work through the Blue with the Blue Line Club to put together this um, drawing that's included in the packet for you. Uh, and Judd and I have worked hard on putting together the budget or the estimate on what we think this project would cost. Um, so included in the packet for you uh, is a summary of, of the budget. We looked at the actual ice rink build in two different ways, one being uh, a con concrete foundation ring that would uh, leave grass inside the ice rink area itself. Uh, and second option, the preferred, I think amongst all of us that have been involved in kind of talking through this proposal, the preferred option is a full concrete slab. Um, that price was included as well. Uh, along with all of the improvements that we see needing to be made, there's some alterations to the dasher boards themselves to make the doors be in the right places and to fit together um, with a new layout to get a Zamboni on and off the ice sheet. Um, there's some, so some alterations there. The concrete work and excavation around the building and getting the slab set up, uh, as well as 
repairs and improvements inside the Blue Line Arena to create a skate tie area in that kind of southeast corner of the rink, um, as well as I'd like to see some improvements to the players' bench area itself in the arena for a capital improvement. If we're there and doing the work, it'd be a good time to do that work as well. Um, so I've included a total price uh, of for the foundation ring option, we expect about $175,000 uh, for the concrete slab portion, $267,000. And you'll see on the bottom of that estimate, it does exclude a couple of items that we don't have pricing for yet. Um, those are in the area where the, the rink is being proposed. There is a sanitary sewer manhole. Um, that, um, in discussing with Dylan at wastewater and with Jason um, there is potential that the line if you look at the utility mapping there's a line that comes out of the blue line arena we think that that line itself is dead um, we don't believe it's in use anymore uh, with the renovations from when it was a temporary school um, the sanitary line certainly is still active coming from that trailhead uh, on the greenway system back towards 4th Street. Uh, so we need to account for the manhole in some way, but depending upon if that line is active coming out of the blue line, Dylan and Jason maybe see a couple different scenarios of how we could plan for that. Um, the way to find that out is we we would have that line televised to see if it's, if it's active. We think it might be full of concrete when you get right inside the blue line, so we'll be able to see that pretty easily. Um, so there'd be a small cost for us to invest in getting that line televised and give us a better idea of what this plan would look like going forward uh, so there may be some cost in if it's an active line we want to leave that manhole cover available and and active um, we'd need to plan for that in the slab so that it'd be a floating manhole that would move with the slab itself um, so that cost is not accounted for and then certainly lighting we'd like to see the, the rink lit up so it can be used at night in the winter um, we haven't accounted for that cost yet we thought we'd start with this conversation today um, and see what the appetite and temperature is here on this project and then um, probably go to water and light for more discussion on lighting and see what kind of partners we can get involved locally on on getting some donations towards that so with that I think I would open it up to any questions um, or give a, a Judd or anybody from the Blue Line Club a chance to speak to Judd do you have anything you want to set up Thank you. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, putting this project together, um, meeting with the Blue Line Club and, and whatnot, you know, we feel um, as part of the Blue Line Club that we would like to take a lead on this, um, but we probably can't handle it. I know we can't handle it all alone. So financially, um, we would need some help, um, but at the same time, I think it's a it's a terrific project, um, you know, for our for our. Our community um, setting a rink up in that side of town I think is is ideal for for many different reasons and obviously you know having the boards donated um, at, at no cost kind of sets us um, in the right direction right away so um, I think on behalf of the Blue Line Club like I said I think we'd like to, to take the lead on it but certainly would would uh, would, would like participation from the city <coughs> yeah good afternoon everybody um like Judd said, I mean, as far as the Blue Line Club, you know, we're, we're very interested in this project. Obviously, we've committed to, buy, you know, pay, getting the boards here anyways at this point in time, taking that step forward. It was a great opportunity to get something like this. Um, we believe it's a very, uh, very, it would be a very enhanced <coughs> amenity um, to our community and, and for our hockey program and, and all kids um, and, and youth. So, yeah, but and we need some help with this project, you know, to... Get it. We'd like to, you know, get it going for this fall or into the winter anyway. So, it, without any help, it, it probably won't happen. It just we're we're going to need some help from the city. Of, I guess is what we're here for today to, to ask for that. So, I guess my question is, what is the blue line prepared to, I mean, pay for, or what are they? What are, is, have you guys talked about it? I, as far as discussions go, you know, we we haven't discussed as far as like a, a final amount or whatever. We have we have a meeting planned for next Wednesday. Um, it's, it was discussed and you know before we got the final numbers here today, you know, we we threw out the you know the big number of where it's going to be a hundred grand, two hundred grand, you know, and and trying to get you know the, the rest of the board members kind of appetite and thoughts on it, and everybody you know it's like they're like well we're going to need some help from the city, you know, but we're willing to commit. You know a good chunk of this um in there 
a dollar amount today. <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't give you something like that at this point That's in time. I didn't know if you guys discussed it. I was just wondering. Sure. Judge, you have something to offer, sir? Yeah, I was just going to say, too, you know, preliminary talks with the Blue Line Club, too, were just about the ring. Um, that, that option one, I guess you could say. And I think since that time period, um, the Blue Line Club members have got feedback from the public as well that they'd like to see a, a poured slab. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the council members maybe have as well. So I think a year round, or not necessarily a year round, but, um, you know, roller hockey in the, in the, uh, in the summer, or whatever else could, it could be used for is beneficial. So obviously the cost is, difference is approximately, what is it, 75 grand, 100 grand? You know, to put to put that slab in, and I think that is a is a uh, is a very good use of our our money if we can make that happen. Um, my my thought process, and I'll go to you, Mr. Larson or the mayor. Um, one thing I was, uh, you know, I did reach out and talk to read a little bit about this and discussion. Okay, let's say that we are looking at this, you know, again discussion. I know that some people aren't in favor of this, but would we close down the Stubbs Park one? We only have two then because, you know, staff that we do have to run everything and take care of everything. You know, like this last year, we were delayed because of snowfall and everything else. We didn't even put ice in them. Um, and so I said, well, if we only do two of them, and this is, let's say this is one of them, where would we get the funds to, to say, okay, we want to participate in this as a city? And one of my uh, thought is, okay, I know we go to this well a lot. But is it partial all true funds that we get? It's say it's fifty thousand dollars, and then it's fifty thousand. What was the other fund you talked about, sir? Building maintenance. Building maintenance fund. So let's say we we committed hundred thousand dollars. Would um, Blue Lion Club look at that? Okay, well we're committed for the rest of it. I, I guess that's a discussion point. I was having discussion with Reed earlier. <coughs> And I thought, well, let's talk about what we're, where appetite is. Um, I think it's something that, you know, is going to be a benefit for the city. It's going to be a good feature. I mean, it's, um, but I also like the idea of talking with him earlier about doing the upgrades that we need to do inside the Blue Line Club. I think it would be a, a good thing to work together so that the projects are simultaneously done and we can move on. So, I don't know. Mayor Jeffson. Oh, I, you answered my question as to pros and cons of doing just the ring versus the solid <coughs> floor and the preference of your group as for, you know, how beneficial would it be for your, your constituents, your players, your kids, to have one versus the other? Would one really function better for more seasons to the cost of that 80000 or whatever additional? And it sounds like you guys, and, and I know the council had the preference early on when we talked about it a month or two ago, like, hey, let's examine the possibility of a solid floor so that we could use it more more of the year. Do you guys have that same thought, that the strong preference for a concrete floor? I mean, I'd probably defer to Judd more on this one. He's more the expert on when it comes to hockey and ice rinks and stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, as far as... I think for maintenance-wise, future use, all you know, length length of use and things like that is probably going to be a lot better in the long run. Yeah, I certainly think the con concrete floor is the way to go if we can make it work um, for many different reasons. You know, I guess number one would probably be, like I said earlier, just multi-use. You know, in summer, spring, fall, and obviously, you know, with ice on in the winter. And I think from another standpoint, which Reed would be able to touch on better, is um, as we're building the rink in the winter. I think your your cost of water is going to be lower than it would be, uh, obviously, if we had grass and it's you know saturating in, and we got to you know freeze the um, freeze the uh, the grass first. So, um, yeah, I think all in all, um, the feedback that I've got from the Blue Line Club, as well as you know people in the community, the the uh, slab is is ultimately the the number one choice. I think Reed wanted to touch base on that also. Yeah, just a couple of numbers on on. <clears throat> on the ease of making ice, I think the, we'd certainly lean towards concrete would make it easier. There are some outdoor rinks in Minnesota, even in southern, like the metro area, that have a concrete floor that are open December 1st for skating. Um, I made a couple of calls today to find that out. And we're a lot of times, our goal is we want our outdoor rinks ready to skate on by the time school Christmas break starts. So they're three weeks ahead of us and they're in the metro area. And largely that's because with the concrete floor, once you have freezing temps at night, you can start building layers of ice where on the grass, we're saturating the ground to get the ground frozen. So that's one benefit to water usage. Um, 
at our outdoor rinks now, some winters we've used as many as 350,000 gallons of water. And I, my estimate at this, just looking at it, I, I think we don't know, but 125,000 gallons of water for the entire season on a concrete floor like that in comparison. So now water is not the most expensive item. I understand that it'll take many years to pay off the cost difference just in water use. But to Judd's point, the benefit of um, all the other functions that could go on on it outside of the ice season, I think it'd be our preference to go with the concrete if we can find the money. Thank you, sir. Good, Mr. Larson. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. President. You actually kind of touched on my question, which was the funding sources, hoping that the um, all true funding would be out there and then other options. So if the building maintenance or if there's other funds, Miss Anderson could potentially help us there to identify what, what we could use that really wouldn't impact our bottom line, recreational dollars, et cetera. But I think it's a great project and uh, looking forward to seeing it. Go ahead. Mr. Vetter. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Two questions. First off, the retaining wall. Is that like a two foot high retaining wall, six foot high retaining wall? What are we looking at? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Steve could, if he has more detail, but uh, 16, 18 inches, two feet in that area. Yeah. Just as you come off the blue line, you're 16 feet away from the blue line arena. We need to cut that down to make yep. a level surface a little bit and build a retaining wall so that the blue line arena holds its foundation solid. Okay, so the, the skaters coming out of the blue line then, you, you wouldn't have them walking down steps, you, they'd be on a, like a path that would slope down? Correct, that, right. that'd be my mindset, is there'd be a gradual slope, that 16 to 20 feet as you come out of the blue line arena would be sloped to get to ice level. Okay, so th then my second concern, if we close down Stouse Park, Stouse Park has got you know, community feel where people can just, they don't have a problem come up there and just recreational skating. Whereas if we put this one up, I don't think it's going to have that, that feel where the community will feel where they can just go and use it because it's close to the Blue Line Arena. How do you anticipate combating that, especially if we're going to close Stouts Park to make it still feel like a commu the community can just go and use it? It's a valuable concern, <laughs> and I don't know that I have a great answer on it. Um, the, the, you know, the answer would be that this outdoor rink operating near the Blue Line Arena would be available and open in the same way that Stouts is at all times. Um, but I certainly see and understand your perception, <laughs> the perception be, being reality in a lot of cases. Um, I don't know... You, I don't want to ha to say we need to close any of the outdoor arenas. I it's not my preference to come here and say that we need to take away a recreation amenity. I don't look at it as taking that away, but it's not my preference to close South Park. It's it is the biggest concern I have with this project though is our ability to maintain it properly and I don't see it being successful if it's three if it's three different outdoor rink locations with our current staffing levels and work load. I don't see us being able to be successful in that. And, and it may be as simple as adding, you know, seating area or something that around the outside where people could feel, or, hey, I can just go here and put my skates on and, and access it. Uh, maybe having another door on, on the roadside, you know, that is accessible so that people park on the road, put their skates on and just access it there without having to walk around onto the the player's bench type of area. Uh, it might be as simple as that. Yeah, great feedback. I appreciate it. Mr. Elms. Thank you. Um, Reed, I kind of have the same <coughs> concern as Mr. Vetter there. Uh, are you still thinking you might be closing the action cells if you put this one in? If this one goes in, my recommendation would be to leave Nash Park open and operating as it has and to close the outdoor rink at Stellis Park. Yeah. Because here's the thing, I think that you know, you're, you're, you're taking stuff away from one end of town and putting it on the other end of town. You know? uh, and this arena, if you build this one out there uh, next to the, the other arena out there, to me right away, as Mr. Vetter said, I'm going to have a set of mind that that's a hockey arena. They're there for hockey practice, and that's probably what it's going to be used for more than anything. 
So that kind of concerns me that we take even Stiles Park away. You know, it's been there for years <coughs> and uh, gets used a lot, except for this year, of course, and we know what the problem was there. But there's a lot of people go to Stiles Park. A lot of people come from Grand Forks just to skate at Stiles Park. So I think somehow we need to figure this out because you were talking about closing those two other parks down because of the cost to run them. Well, I see this one that you want to put on the point, it's going to cost more to run that one than it's going to cost to run this one. I don't think he, we, he ever, ever said anything about Nash Park being closed down. This year was the reason why they weren't open. There's never been a comment that Nash Park was ever going to be closed down. So I don't want that out in the public that people are going to start calling saying, well, Mr. Helms, this is what he said. Well, it's not true. It was never said. It was always talked about Stouts Park as an option if we were going to move forward. This was a discussion we had a month ago or two months ago. So it never was Nash Park being considered. Um, and just to maybe add a little more in the thought process and why I've talked about Stelz Park as the one, it's not trying to pick or pull any amenity from any neighborhood. Um, when the warming houses are open, historically we always have sign-in sheets and every skater that comes to skate in the warming house is asked to sign in. And historically, going back the 10 years that we have good records, each year there are more sign-ins for skaters at Nash than there are at Stouse. Um, on average, there's probably 900 to 1,000 skaters that sign in at Nash Park, and that number has dropped to more of the average of a 500 skaters per winter at Stouse when the warming house has been open. Um, we also ask in those numbers for them to say what age they are. and uh, the age demographic in the Nash Park area is much more in the, I'd say, 6 to 14 age category, while Stiles Park leans more towards uh, the high school and college age demographic. And I guess I, I reason in that thinking that um, Stiles Park is a little more of a destination where you would be more comfortable driving to it at this point than walking, where Nash is still a little more... Uh, condensed in a residential neighborhood. Uh, so for those reasons, that's why I've recommended that if we would need to close one, we would close Stouse. And again, all of this just comes back to my feelings on our staff's ability to successfully maintain these rinks the way we need to to serve the public. Anything else, sir? If yeah, I could like, just jump in real quick on what Reed said about the demographic of driving. If they're already driving, they could just easily drive to the VFW as to Stouts. Blue line code. Yeah, blue line. Judge, did you want to add something before I go to Mr. Riepel? Okay, Mr. Riepel. I'm thinking just the opposite on Mr. Helm's thing is that with this rink opening and the possibility of more practices being utilized there, it might open up a lot more time for free skating or for open skating for other individuals inside where they're more apt to come than the outside. That's for the older population, the 25 to 65 year olds that still skate. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, one, I mean, something that could possibly be done with as far as scheduling of this open ice sheet, you know, is adding another column to the weekly um, schedule as far as the arena schedule or something like that and having that on there because maybe there might be something that might be scheduled for an hour or something like that maybe a team wants to use it for a team bonding experience or something that one evening or something like that but then you know having that listing of open skate you know having that publicized i think on there probably could get the word out a little bit more as far as it's it's open it's ready for all skaters of east ground fork so mr emery um i just wanted to comment reed is exactly correct i mean that retaining wall you know is going to be in that foot and a half to two foot range one thing Judd and I have discussed is that sidewalk kind of on the south side of the end there. Um, you know, with that foot and a half to two foot difference, you know, are we going to be able to slope that? I don't know. It might get too steep there. So that's something we got to work through. You know, it, it could be possible because we can't excavate down that foot and a half to two feet right at the building. You know, we may end up potentially with a step there. So it's just something we got to look at and review. Mr. Prochavinsky. Thank you. Um, does Blue Line see practices being scheduled on this new arena regularly? 
you know, in all the discussions I've had with Reed, I don't think it's came up once that we're going to schedule practices on the rink. Um, the rink, number one, is not going to have any lines on it, you know, no face-off circles, face-off dots. Um, so, you know, ultimately it's an outdoor rink. And, and um, you know, to Clarence's point earlier on, there, there is going to be a door, a new door on the, on the uh, east side of the building, southeast side of the building, that, you know, people can come from the public or if they want to park on the road or on the, the south end of the Blue Line Club, um, can come in that door. And then, like Reed was t talking before, we are adding benches and rubber flooring in that area to act as a you know a warming area slash um, to get addressed in in the blue line club arena but like, like to your question again we have have not discussed any practices at all on that rink but you know like mike said there might be a day or two or <clears throat> or time or two when a, a team wants to go out there in nice weather and just kind of have fun so i can see that happening for sure okay hey, i um so you're not painting the lines or dots or anything on it i I would think we should if we're putting cement down we should at least put you know the the red lines the blue lines and the dots on there um, <clears throat> and then I would ask that if if um, along with Mr. Riappel's comment that if a team is scheduling time on the outdoor rink that the indoor rink be available for the public to skate on so those are my comments thanks Ms. Peterson my only concern about this is timing with everything else that we've got going on in Parks and Rec with the new buildings and things like that. That's my concern is, is the timing of it and getting that. And before we move forward, I think that I would really like to know for sure how much funding that we would, would be, the blue line would be contributing at this point. Carly, do you have something? I'm just wondering. If you're going to talk, can you come up to the mic, please? I just had a question for Reed if there's a possibility of putting pickleball courts in there because people are always looking for that in the summer. Yeah, it's a great question. We haven't discussed at all what the summer months could look like. I think there's a lot of different ways that could be used. Pickleball is certainly one that's been in my head. If there needs to be expansion to the eight courts that are there already, um, that's a great one. We've we've talked roller hockey. Um, there's numerous, numerous activities that could be held inside there. Right now, lacrosse is using the Blue Line Arena uh, because it's too wet to be out in the fields, and I'm sure that spring sports, the second that concrete is dry, would love to be able to have another place that the balls would be contained and would be playing. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of great options if it's a concrete floor. I guess my thought process would, would also be like to know what the blue line, I don't know when you guys, when did you say you're meeting again? Next week. Next week? Next week, Wednesday. Okay. So we'd be able to come back to the following work session to have a more in-depth talk on it? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Mayor, did you have something? Oh, good. Okay. I thought you said Thank you. Anybody else have anything to offer? Appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Anyway, have a good night. Consider the Outdoor Fitness Court Grant Initiative. Reed. Thanks again, Mr. President. Um, just for, for kind of feedback and discussion, uh, the National Fitness Campaign, we'd, we'd heard about this and talked about it. I'm going to guess 2018 or 19 time frame. Same program that we talked about then um, with the one extra partner, National Fitness Campaign has reached out um, to ask if they're, they're searching for cities in Minnesota that would be willing to partner with them. They have added Blue Cross Blue Shield Minnesota as a statewide sponsor. Um, Blue Cross has committed a half a million dollars each year, 2023 and 24, to try to help get these outdoor fitness courts built in cities in Minnesota. So the National Fitness Campaign's goal is to get 20 cities committed in the next two years. Um, the court layout uh, is pretty simple in that it's about a 40 foot by 40 foot concrete pad. National Fitness Campaign sends all of this pre-subscribed equipment uh, that would be installed or mounted on that concrete. Uh, as you see in the packet, there's kind of an artistic wall that a local artist would be able to give feedback on building an art, art piece to go along with it. Um, local commitment 
uh, national fitness campaign if we would want to apply. They, they run it as a grant, so we would need to apply for a grant to get <coughs> approval from the campaign to move forward. And if they select us in moving forward, uh, they would work with us locally to set up a fundraising campaign and try to fundraise the dollars to commit the local share, let's call it. Um, in discussion with them asking, uh, even with fundraising, they often see across the country the city's typical investment is in that fifty to seventy-five thousand dollar area. So that is in addition to any fundraising success that they would have. In some cases, they have had enough success that uh, a local health partner or a, a health system has stepped up and thought it was really important, and you know, essentially funded the entire local share. So um, at this point. Um, asking for feedback and direction from you on if this is something that we should consider pursuing, requesting a, an application for a grant and moving forward. Um, I think the last thing I forgot to touch on or should touch on is in just er the couple of early phone calls I've had with them, they have looked at, um, I don't know what the technical word for it is off the top of my head, but like those geo-mapping site bubbles of where they track cell phone data to see where people congregate and visit the most. And with that data, they like the Sherlock Park location as kind of the preferred park if there's space and it meets all of their criteria um, because they see that that area has a lot of traffic in the summer months. Um, but certainly they're open to any direction from us if we wanted to move into that step. But with that, I'm open for any comments or feedback on how to move forward. Mr. Larson. Yeah, I'm sure we're all thinking, you know, would they help us pay for an outdoor rink? Or that was my initial thought. I'm like, great, you know, we're in northern Minnesota. We need an ice rink, um, a year-round rink, actually. Um, but that, that just kind of leads to my comment is I, I think it's a cool idea. I, I would personally prioritize our previous discussion over, over this project. So I, I'd rather see that project uh, completed and then come back and revisit this unless Reed can sweet talk him into helping us uh, build out a outdoor rink. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Mary I, I would worry about how much this would be utilized and if someone offered to build it turnkey at no cost I think it would be worth it but any local expenditure on this again with concern about utilization I don't think it would be a real good investment. Anybody else have anything? I think the same sentiments I have. I think the usage would be questionable, and I guess how long we could use it every year. Um, I would I would say not at this time for me. So. Very good. Thank you, sir. Number six update from ad hoc <coughs> finance committee, Mr. Vetter. Thank you. Computer is slow. Uh, we've met a number of times, had numerous discussions on not only, well, when you look at budgets, you always look at two things, revenues and expenses. So we have had looked at revenues and where can we find ways to adjust our, our revenues coming in. Uh, the problem with that is that's small potatoes in the whole scheme of things. We have looked at expenses. Uh, we had a lot of good discussion as you can look at like contracted services. When we first started out, it seemed every department was doing their own thing and got the departments to talk together and copiers for one, everyone's gonna get together and use one vendor and try and get a better prices for that one vendor. So. Again, kind of small potatoes, but it's moving forward in the same uh, token that we can get to the end run. Uh, we're really struggling because we don't have a lot of directions from the council. So this is the time for the council, and we're reaching out to you. Are you happy with a 3% increase in budgets, 5% increase in budgets, 10% increase in budgets? Where do you sit? And if it's a... 3% or 5% increase in budgets and salaries because of inflation take up 4% of that, how do we make up the rest? Are you comfortable cutting expenses, cutting positions, cutting services, 
If it's services, are you comfortable? What services are you comfortable in cutting? Uh, we've talked about a number of different positions, cutting positions, and how that would work with the city. We haven't really landed on anything concrete. One area that we've kind of got some traction with is removal of snow and city sidewalks. Uh, safe routes to schools has kind of ballooned and we're removing snow on a lot of sidewalks. And so we've had the discussion that should we be removing the snow on those sidewalks or should we put that back on the homeowner's responsibility. Um, and top of my head, it's about five to six hours to remove snow on those city sidewalks. And so yes, that's a savings. Would we see any of that or would we just, the other sidewalks that we're cleaning would get done that much faster then. Um, but that's just an example of, it's a service that we're providing now. It's something that we could look at cutting. Are we comfortable cutting that type of a service? And what other services would everyone be comfortable in cutting? So we're throwing it out, asking each council member or mayor to chime in and give us some direction on how you want us to move forward. And I a couple questions on here, um, mainly on the bottom. I guess, <clears throat> Charlotte, I mean, when you guys put on here, if libraries should join the regional library system, what does that mean? I mean, what cost savings is that, or what does that all entail? <clears throat> is it like, okay, with it's your staff gets from here to here, or what's good? I, I guess I don't understand. No, uh, every few years we do do a regional, um, we have a conversation with the regional library to see if it's something worthwhile. So it, it wasn't a brand new idea. And I spoke with the executive uh, director who's in Moorhead. And we reviewed the pros and cons, and it still comes out as if our library were to join the regional system, we would lose hours, staffing, and programming because we would have to go to the level that's being provided at other libraries. Um, and there again, like Mr. Vetter said, it's the service level that we have had here that is excellent, that we have maintained, which would have to be cut. The library building would be under the city's care, but the um, personnel, the staffing, uh, the programming, the collection, all of that would be under the regional system. Regional libraries also, um, when they gather their monies to take care of the system, they also look into the rural, which we have no rural money coming into the city for the library. And what comes from Polk County rural residents would not change. It would remain the same because they're only taxed for the library services that could be provided within the county and that still would go into the region. So that wouldn't benefit us any more than it is now, which it's not. Um, does that answer all your questions? Do I need something more? So I, I, I guess, I mean, putting... Yes, Laurel, yeah. So, I mean, putting on the list, that's, that was my question, is uh, what cost savings we are if we're gonna actually look at declining services and also you mentioned maybe clarity you mentioned that the city would own the building in the contents books staff, no or? no the the library the city would maintain the building but the collection becomes part of the regional system um, yeah, and so right here, now here you go here's the collection our, well, each contract has to be written up between each signatory within the region. So that would be a point of discussion, but it would be considered part of the regional's collection, not the city's collection. Which, um, you know, that's always a concern with special collections, which we do have um, special collections in East Grand Forks. Uh, certain uh, Certain advantages to the regional system is if 
if you were to go to the lake in the summertime with your East Grand Forks library card, you cannot use it at the Bemidji Library. Uh, but the Bemidji Library card can be used throughout the state at most libraries. There are four unaffiliated independent libraries at this point. Uh, as far as within the Lake Agassiz Regional Library, the Laurel, the closest size-wise library is Detroit Lakes. And they're a fairly good comparison as far as size of city and they have a tourist season and we have a border. So kind of balancing those as people that you can't tax for services but take advantage of the services. Um, and I spoke to, I took the time to speak to the director at Detroit Lakes and the biggest positive she came up with for me was that instead of making library decisions surrounded by other departments, you'd make library decisions surrounded by other librarians. Um, other than that, she said it's a lot more work because the library building is separate from the regional system. So to get the roof fixed, we'd be coming back and talking about just the roof, not any services. You wouldn't be taking care of any of that. It could, and they have a formula that they use with the regional system to determine how much each signatory puts into the system. And they will come to the city and say uh, they could approximately ask us for say $300,000, $350,000. And if you say, we'll give you three, not three fifty, that doesn't change the regional uh, service. What it would do is they would cut it from East Grand Forks. So even though it's going into the big pot, anything less than what they ask would be you know, our hours, our staffing, our services. So then in turn, <clears throat> in turn, you would be paid by them. You wouldn't be paid by us anymore. Is that right? Um, each, <coughs> each, um, <coughs> each library system does it a little bit differently in that the majority, all the employees would be part of the regional system and it would be determined whether a library director or a branch manager is what they would be called is a city, remains a city employee or a regional employee. And that would be dependent upon if the city of East Grand Forks determined that the library director was still a department head. And that would have to be a negotiation. It takes anywhere from six to nine months to negotiate a contract. And usually the contracts say you have to give six to nine months notice if you're going to leave a regional system. We have gotten to the point where we've asked to do contracts before to look at them, and they weren't able to put a dollar amount on it until we signed a contract, and so we didn't do that at that time. No, I wouldn't either. No. No. So First basically, basically joining this would be a step back from what services we provide now and weighing out the cost of it less would not benefit what your outreach and everything you do now. Uh, that's the gist I'm getting. Yep. It would easily be, well, I'd like, well, I would say at a very minimum it would be 30% and it could be as much as 50% of what we do would be cut by the regional system. And they're not encouraging it. I mean, they look at us as an example of how to do it well and they would hate to see for us to cut back. So why, why would they not look at improving their way they do things? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> That's so. up to them. Yeah. Um. And that's what we've done. We've, we've thrown a lot of darts at the wall. Oh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so now we're just saying, are we interested in keeping our library where it's at, or is that a place where we could look at Cutting some costs and saving some money is going to cut services, but that's why I asked the question because it doesn't, yep. you know, 
the bullet point, you know. Yep. And I guess the other questions I had on here, um, and I guess Chief's not on, talk about the Polk County dispatching, so I, I guess we can, I can reach out to him. I know they can't offer right now without staff, but I know we talked about in the past years ago about joining with Polk County and being able to do the dispatching from there. I, I, it's been a while, um, and I don't know what even the cost savings would be for us on that because it's been probably six, eight years since even discussion of that. Yeah, um, we, we haven't gotten to the point where we've gotten that, that deep into the cost savings. And what it would really change is you know, it, would, it would change up. Uh, we wouldn't have to have that person in the... Right. in there anymore so it would, we'd, we'd be able to go maybe one less per shift right so um i i had a comment on the uh chief told us that crookston has their own dispatch during the day but polk county does at night isn't that what he said clarence i believe you're correct yeah and i challenged him i thought we would need dispatching here during the evening just because of you know, if we're housing someone here you need someone at at the police station anyway so why not do our own dispatching at night but there may be ways that during the day we could look at not having an officer doing the dispatching there's enough other people in the police station during the day that they could maybe rotate every couple hours throughout them again just challenging the the staff to think outside the box and how can we change things up and do mm -hmm. things different and save money and crookston does not pay Paul county for dispatching okay. Um, one back up there, you know, talked about uh, contracting services um, and one positions, attorney engineering, fees, expenses will be, you know, I know that maybe it was right when I came on, this was brought up or shortly after that, talking about, I think at that time maybe it was an engineering aspect of it. Um, but what have we looked at what our true saving i mean i know it's a discussion point i know you, you guys but really have we looked at this wow this wow, what are we doing this for why don't we do this you know i mean I've, i guess that's my thought is okay if we're gonna have to look at stuff that maybe we could do i mean we can ask all the questions we want but we're really how are we going to know what's going to if it's something we want to move forward with and that's just an example. I could be yep. any 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 staff. I don't know. Yeah, and I agree with you. And right now, it's been somewhat on the protecting my turf avenue. So, and again, that's why we're looking for direction. If we come to the next meeting and council has said we don't want more than a five percent increase in our budget, that gives us direction. If the council comes back and says. We're pre all pretty comfortable with the level of services where we're at, and we want that 5% budget, okay, that gives us something that we can work with. Mm -hmm. uh, if the council comes back and says, uh, I only want a 3% increase, and I don't care if you cut, cut expenditures to get there, okay, that gives us direction. But we need that direction. Mm -hmm. If I might, oh, go yeah, ahead. Ben, go ahead. I'm good. My question was answered. Okay. Mayor? If I take a look at the recent property tax statements that have come out, um, we did, uh, as we all are aware, we did a 10% increase. And the thought was that hopefully to each individual homeowner, they'd see a lot less than that. But then I also think our valuations are going up, probably higher here than in other parts of the county. And it did carry to a pretty significant increase then to individual homeowners. I don't know if anyone else did the did the math, but mm -hmm. I think mine was close to the full 10% that came onto mine just because of the increased valuation. And again, uh, it's it's a product of the home sales here are brisk. Um, we sold my folks home in about three days after it was on the market. We had a, a purchase agreement signed and, and sealed and delivered right up to our asking price or very, very close to it. Um, home sales are brisk. And because of that, then our, our county assessors have to come in and raise the valuations before the state does it, and, and it's a real thing. So I guess my point with that is, um, in this last tax cycle, and, and we talked also to the folks from the county, 
they worked really, really hard to keep the levy increase close to zero um, this year as for at the county level. And I appreciate that they did that. And I guess I would challenge us, we don't have to go to zero. Uh, I'd say really look at that 5% number. That's a, that's a real number in my mind. Coming off of 10, I do think we're gonna have to find a way to keep it in that range of five as a, as a good target. I don't know how anyone else feels, um, but everybody's gotten pinched. All of our residents have gotten pinched in so many ways, whether it's fuel or just everything. Um, so it's a good thing for us to be mindful of that and uh, really try to constrain ourselves to that five. That would be my viewpoint. Anyone else can weigh in? I know when we talked to um, the, an intergovernmental retreat, that Polk County said that they, it was at 4%, and a lot of the property on the lake property went up way more than they did within the city, so they took more of that 4% than anybody else in the county. So we need to be mindful of that, that the county has that in their pocket and can collect more on their levy because of that than us. Anybody else have any comments on the levy? Mr. Larson. Yeah, I, I think 5% uh, it's been mentioned by a few folks here is a good goal. I think it's going to be a real challenge to get there. I think it's going to be a challenge to get to single digits, uh, but we we should be aggressive at, you know, in the onset, and I would encourage us to look at operating expenses and not cutting one-time expenses or deferring things like building maintenance and try to make some, some real long-lasting change and not just push the can down the road, which, which I know you won't do. Uh, but I, I think to answer probably the toughest question is, yes, I think we should look at a reduction in services. In, in my opinion, that's probably the best way to lower operating expenses. We just have to be careful that we don't tip over that line and become an unwelcoming city to live in. This is really a tightrope act. We go too far to one side who wants to live here anymore? So it's this is not an easy task, and thank you for everyone for all the extra work you're putting into this. Thank you. Mr. Rippa? I think once our labor negotiations get through, we're gonna have a little better idea where we stand. That's hopefully coming soon, right? Then we'll have a better idea. I, I like the 5%, but we might be pipe dream there. Anybody else have anything? Reminder of water and light got 6% for right now the year end. 6, 5, and 4, just so everybody <coughs> has that in mind. When they're done with this study, we aren't going to save any money from the study. So, so my mind, I know that 5% looks great, you know, on paper when we're talking about it and looking at it. And as Mr. Riappel said, you know, negotiations uh, with the unions this year are going to be challenging to say the least um, not just on wages so we're going to have to look at the cost of our health insurance because we only signed a one-year contract correct mm -hmm. so that's going to be something that we're going to really going to have to look at uh, hopefully we don't go up um, if it is does go up hopefully it's minimal but you know would we end up with 25 percent increase or was it 20 was it 30? I mean, so I think looking at a five, I think we, as Mr. Larson said, it's going to be challenging. Um, but it's something that we, be, we need to maybe shoot for. Um, and, you know, if we look at, once we get done with, you know, finding out the insurance down the road, which we won't find out anyway until what this fall, right? For that, so I mean, that's I wish they would do that now. <laughs> you know, it'd be great, but that's not how they work. Um, so I think if we're looking at five, I think it's going to be, you know, a challenge. It is. It is going to be um, something that we need to shoot for, though. So. Anybody else have anything to offer on this? Any questions for Mr. Vetter or the committee? Anything else, Mr. Vetter, for us? 
just the, thanks for your comments and your input. Every little bit's going to help. So we'll go back to the drawing board. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Larson, second by Riopel. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried, means adjourned. You just told you how hard your job is. Didn't you hear that?